Okay, it is two o'clock, so we might as well get started. Um, do you want to give the backstory? No, go ahead. Okay. In 2016, we had a client uh, in the Caribbean, of all places, get r attacked by ransomware. And they completely locked out their FileMaker server and every other server. The whole network was down. All their backups were gone. Uh, we had fortunately taken an off-site backup for them, so they were able to recover that, and they had to reconstruct all their transactions. But um, we sort of heard about ransomware before then, but um, we didn't know much about it. And, you know, we have, you know, in the web development world, there's this notion of being a full-stack web developer where you're familiar with all the technologies involved. And if you kind of map that idea to FileMaker, if you want to be a full-stack FileMaker developer, you should be familiar with the server hardware that it runs on and how to protect it and how backups work and some of the stuff that has nothing to do with FileMaker developer, development. But uh, if you want to say, I know everything there is to know about deploying FileMaker, you need to know some of these things. So at that point in time, we decided that for us to you know, mentally call ourselves full-stack FileMaker developers, we needed to become more familiar with ransomware and how to protect FileMaker servers against it. And so um, that process took us to DEF CON, which is a hacker conference in Las Vegas, and we started going to a lot of hacker conferences, and that eventually led to this presentation. We've given this a couple times before, but recently we came across some really cool um, techniques for extracting the encryption key that you can pick the attacker in the app that we haven't shown before. So we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, so this is what it looks like if you've been had. Um, you'll get a screen something like this. You won't be able to get to the command line. You won't be able to get to Windows Explorer or whatever it is. And you'll get a message like this. This one happens to be a screenshot of uh, WannaCry. Yeah. But fun fact, though, uh, in Andre's presentation yesterday, he wasn't talking about, he's talking about, uh, so you know there's ransomware as a service, R-A-A-S. Um, but they actually have templates for, you know, you have templates of here, use this template or you can change the color, have a different look and feel. So these, you know, very professional starter files and everything for their ransoming. Um, uh, my, my name is Chris Moyer. I've been, uh, I used to work at Claris uh, back in the day, early 90s uh, as a sales engineer. I've uh, co-written some FileMaker books. I've written a ton of FileMaker training materials. I was actually involved in the FileMaker 7, the very first FileMaker certification test. That was an interesting experience. And uh, have been writing databases since the early 90s. So it's been a while. And my name is Heidi Porter. I'm a co-owner of the Moyer Group. I have a background in engineering computer science and kind of have a lot of different varied experience in the IT and coding areas. And uh, I actually worked at, uh, I started out in, uh, networking at IBM uh, back in the 90s. So that was an interesting as far as all the security aspects. And I've spoken at Engage and a lot of conferences and user groups. All right. So um, some of these stats might be a little bit old, but um, there's a lot of ransomware attacks happening and you don't hear about them. I mean, you think you might hear about them because you hear Colonial Pipeline or I guess uh, uh, Danish 7-Eleven stores in this area or, um, you know, some government, et cetera. You know, I've seen some recent ones in The Economist. Uh, but they happen a lot more than that. And they actually happen um, to small and medium businesses and small and local governments and hospitals um, the most. So kind of the sweet spot of FileMaker is the sweet spot of ransomware attacks. So I just want to get that out there. Um, the average ransom paid in 2021, uh, we had 170,000. Um, Andre had that it had ballooned up to 570,000. I believe that's because there's a lot more reporting requirements now for uh, ransomware. It was probably happening a lot and it wasn't reported. Now it's reported more. And recently in the US, there was a um, article about uh, banks paying like 1.2 or 12 billion dollars, you know, whatever. It was a large sum of money um, in ransom in 2021. And it's partly they have this information because of all these additional reporting requirements. The thing is, if you get ransomware and you have to pay, uh, you're more likely to be attacked again because they know you're vulnerable, you paid before, etc. 
And sometimes when you get your data back, you know, uh, you know, honor among thieves, maybe, maybe not, uh, it might still be corrupted. It can uh, take people's, so this isn't just you, this is your clients, right? Take their business down, uh, potential cost of reputational damage. And uh, when we started talking about doing this presentation for PAWS in America uh, last October, we asked people if people would be interested and everybody had a story about either their cells being ransomed that we had never heard of um, or someone else they knew having to, had to deal with a client that had been ransomed. So it's happening and, you know, I think with security, you got to not think, you know, if it happens, you got to say, think when, you know, it will probably, something will happen to you at some point. So when you look at the ransomware process, um, and this is kind of the scary thing, uh, but it's also can be a useful thing to know is, so they get in, you know, via some compromise and our talk earlier today about device security uh, and different security for web versus iPhone, et cetera, uh, talked about different compromises or attack vectors as they can get in through. And I'll tell you right now, we'll talk about later, the top three are email phishing, uh, unpatched software, and weak passwords. And so uh, we had additional details in, that, in our talk this morning about some of those areas. But once they're in, they're um, basically you know, it's called burrowing and tunneling here and feeding information to an offsite server, you know, called command and control. It's called C2 in hacker terminology and um, looking through directories to see what's what's important here. What data, you know, now ransomware games aren't just ransomwareing and, you know, holding encrypting your server. They're seeing, oh, you have some data that could be embarrassing or that your customers don't want you to. Uh, you know, have public, and so they can exploit you for that. Um, but the actual, if they're going to ransomware the server, you know, hold it for ransom, kidnap it, they're going to encrypt it. But they also can do, and Chris will talk about this, uh, kind of uh, exploiting your data. So this is one of the biggest ransomware gangs. Uh, they're not a Lockbit 3.0, but screenshot is the thing. And so their advertising is as good as any software vendor I've ever seen. So you can fire up a Tor browser and go out on the dark web and you know find, here's ransomware as a service, here's why we're great. You know We have an affiliate program and here's why we're better than anyone else out there who's providing ransomware as a service. And when we uh, exfiltrate data, we'll post it up here and here's the leaked data and there's a clock running on here. So any company who's had their data stolen can see I've got you know 12 hours or whatever it is to pay the ransom or else my stuff is going to get published. And here's an airline and there's all sorts of uh, different sorts of companies here. Some of you may remember the Sony hack from a few years ago where they were leaking embarrassing emails where they were trash talking actors. They released a whole movie that uh, hadn't come out yet and stuff like that. And so depending on the company and what sort of intellectual property they have or customer list they have, this could be a very powerful motivator for to extort a company for payment. So it's not just encryption, it's also extortion. And then here they have a nice side-by-side -side comparison. I wish Claris would do this. A side-by-side -side comparison of why we're the best and the other guys are not so good. So let's take it to them. Sorry, Julie, couldn't help myself. Uh, let's see. Um, so as Heidi mentioned, we sort of talked to a bunch of people in the community and we heard different stories. And uh, anecdotally, what we were hearing is that if the databases were up and running, FileMaker server had a share lock on them and they could not be encrypted. Um, typically, the way ransomware works is they want to attack your net, you know, actually trigger the attack when nobody's around. So like late Friday night before a holiday weekend in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., they don't want IT personnel to be on the network because they can immediately put a stop to things and unplug routers and whatnot. And so ideally they like to do this in the middle of the night. They hit a company in the UK like mid-morning, like 10 a.m. or something like that. And we think they thought they were in the US and you know everyone was asleep, but no, it was the middle of the morning. So they were able to quickly stop the attack. But uh, they saw that they were attacking the FileMaker server, and the FileMaker server came through pretty much unscathed. Because it was open. 
Yeah. Yeah, because the databases, the databases were open. open. Yeah. And so that's nice. Um, being on a Macintosh tends to protect you versus being on a Windows server. So if you're hosting on Windows, Windows is a much juicier target. These ransomware gangs can be really good at attacking Windows infrastructure. Not as much on Linux, not as much on Mac OS. So just hosting your database on a Mac is some level of protection. Hosting your database on Linux is a level of protection. So I personally don't have a problem with Claris going to a Linux-only FileMaker server. I think that's going to be uh, helpful in the long run. Uh, any externally stored container data got encrypted. You didn't have a file lock on that, but the databases themselves seem to survive encryption attempts. And, and we're actually going to uh, show you a demo yeah. in a few minutes to actually demonstrate how this looks. So, I mean, that shouldn't make you feel better that, you know, it because you can drop locks on a file, an open database, and that makes it sound like, you know, it's not that bad if you get ransomware because you're, your, or your file is open. So I just want to go back to not trying to be scary, but it's true. I mean, we know recently uh, many there's been FileMaker servers ransomed and businesses down, et cetera. And um, it, it is still happening. It didn't, it didn't just happen in 2021. It happens and, you know, any databases that were closed are going to get encrypted. Um, and like I said at the beginning, they're in there and they're looking at what you have and what they do that I didn't mention on that slide was they, they start by encrypting the backups if the backups are accessible, right? So they encrypt the backups and then they go for your live file at some later point, like maybe middle of the night or something like that. And then you have no backups to go back up to. So we'll Yeah, and, and Heidi brings up a good point. So, so yeah. far, FileMaker having the databases open seems to be protective. But like in the world of Microsoft, there's a tool called handle.exe and that can force any process to drop the handle it has on a file. And so if you have FileMaker server holding on to databases that it's hosting, and all of a sudden it gets kicked off those files, you've probably corrupted the files. If there's any unwritten transactions in the database cache or anything like that, those files are not gonna be in good shape. And so as of right now, having the files open is protective, but we, you know, no one can guarantee that that'll be the case you know, next year or the year after. Yeah, I mean, these. These, uh, these ransomware games have gained, it's a really successful business model. They have a huge return on investment for what they're doing and it's constantly evolving. So just because they do or don't do something now, they can evolve to do it later, like uh, you know, close the database, et cetera, or drop the file lock. Um, and the other thing is, is that different ransomware games, you know, they have these advertisements, they have, you know, lower code ones and they have higher pro ones, you know, and so you, you know, there's different levels of ransomware gangs that can do um, more uh, complex ransomware attacks. All right, so um, we st also, st so we started looking at uh, ransomware simulation frameworks because we saw one at DEF CON and we were sharing this, we were asking about doing this presentation on a, on a um, meetup and Wim DeCourt, who's you know always into punishing servers, said, "I want to help with that." So um, he took on looking at the simulation framework to basically ransomware a FileMaker server, simulate that, and see what happens and decrypt it. Um, so he looked at impacts to databases, um, and then we've looked at some various defenses and detection techniques, etc. Do you want to say anything about the demo? Uh, the demo. Nope, I don't have much to say about the demo. So uh, we have a video, sadly Wim could not uh, be here today, but we have a video of Wim running through the, the Racketeer simulation. So what he's going to show you is the command and control server, the uh, uh, ransomware getting triggered, and attacking a FileMaker server, and you can sort of see how that plays out. And remember that the command and control is an off-site server that the ransomware gang is, you know, getting information from, from its agents that are deployed. Uh, and here we go, I'll put the microphone over the left side. What we have in the demo is I have a FileMic server, um, nothing too fancy, this is the latest FileMic server running on AWS EC2 instance. And because we're going to simulate the tail end of the, of the attack, we're, we're basically going to assume at this point that your, your server has been affected. We already have an agent uh, on there, so uh, 
I have this uh, this agent. It's disguising itself as file connector. Um, actually, I'll, I'll run it. Um, there we go. Uh, of course, typically you wouldn't see this kind of feedback, right? So it would be it's just a process that runs on on the server somewhere. Um, uh, but I I have it. Uh, set to verbose mode so that we can actually see what it's doing and it's not really doing anything but it's basically trying to ping the control center uh, and see hey uh, master if you will uh, are you there or are you uh, can I report back to you um, the, the things that we have in red there is, is that the master isn't listening at this point so we'll, we'll fix that in a moment All right so that's the FileMaker server that's the FileMaker server in, in your network your on-premise server uh, anything like that but that's what you have now I'm the evil guy, so I'm sitting somewhere, uh, and I have this uh, this little uh, Ubuntu Linux box here, uh, nothing too fancy, but um, I will fire off my database. All right, and uh, what I need is just start the master software, if you will, and this is the part of the, sorry, uh, Taking one step back, the framework uh, that I'm using is on GitHub, right? So, um, uh, so you can download it for free. It has two components, obviously. It has a server component, that's the one that we're looking at here, um, that basically mimics the command and control center. Then there's the agent components, uh, the one that I installed on my FileMaker server, that's the other part, right? And both of them are open source. The FileMaker, sorry, the server part is written in Go. The uh, agent is written in C Sharp. Um, so you can just tweak them to your heart's content. I will just fire the server. And with the server running, if we were to go back and look at, at, the, um, at the agent here, uh, you'll see that the agent uh, now gets a response from the uh, master from the control center, right? So the agent is now talking to the control center. Uh, the moment leading up to the actual attack, it is probably when the agent and the server, or the attackers, if you will, are at the most vulnerable, right? Because they have to communicate and they have to do things. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in a little later, but encrypting files is a somewhat heavy activity, right? It's processor he uh, heavy, it's disk uh, heavy. So again, that's when, when, where the know your normal comes into play, right? So you need to be able to detect that, the fact that there is network communication happening that is over and beyond what, what is your normal. You need to be able to detect that there is processor activity that is not normal, and you need to be able to detect that there is disk activity that is not normal. All right, so uh, what I want to do from my control center, right? So I'm back to being the evil guy that um, at this point in the process, as the evil guy, I think I have enough information about everything that you have, right? So I'm just going to set everything up so that I can pull the trigger. Um, so the first thing that I'll do is I want to see if I have any agents listening uh, or reporting in at this point, right? So um, you can see here uh, I have no active agents, but I have one pending agent. That's the agent that's running on my FileMaker server. So I'll just go ahead and get the UID here and activate the agents. So if I do activate again, you can see now that the agent has switched from pending to active. So what this means is that um, my control center now is in active communication with this agent. So I'm, I'm ready to do stuff. And, and I want to pause here for a second because um, the reason that you have this agent coded to the uh, control server is that there are so many ransomware gangs, they're tripping over each other. If they find an easily breached customer, there might be two or three people jockeying for position in there. And it's not uncommon for one of them to find a process running for somebody else and try and commandeer it. So this is enough of a problem that they now have to encode their uh, agents running on the infected network so that it'll only answer the phone for their command and control server and not somebody else's command and control server. So I find it interesting that this is such good business that they are fighting with each other. Right, so... Um one of the protections that that um, these ransomware frameworks or ransomware attacks uh, have as well is that they will they will build in their own protection, right? So they they may assume that you have detected the agent and that you have compromised the agent, right? Like your counterattacks may try to compromise the agent so that you can send 
a, a payload to the reverse way, right? Um, basically attacking the attacker, if you will. So um, in order to protect that, typically there will be some sort of exchange of keys between the master and the agent so that, that the master still knows that he can trust the agent. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'll send over the master key um, so that I know I'm good. All right. So at this point in the attack, my control center is uh, is talking to the agent. The agent is talking to the control center. We're good to go. So I, I can now make that agent do stuff. Uh, that's when the actual attack will happen. And the way that an attack like this uh, takes shape is I have, well, the framework here uses a JSON file. Right? and they, what they call a policy. And this is the policy to do a full encryption of everything that, that is, it's basically a set of instructions, right? Uh, and as you can see here from the bottom, the, that JSON file actually lives on my Racketeer server, uh, Racketeer being the, uh, the framework here. So what, what a policy like that, the policy, that's the, the, the plan of attack that I, that I mentioned earlier, right? That's everything that I've learned everything that I need for the attack to happen. Um, so the top section here, that's basically telling the agent, like uh, report back to this, uh, to this external uh, master. I can have multiple, right? So I can, have, I can build in my own redundancy if I will, so that if you were to take down this particular control center, it will still continue with another control center somewhere else. Um, I'll have the site ID, that's the same UUID. Uh, you may uh, remember that from what I typed in there. You want to know what agent I'm talking to, and then there's the master key that will be used for the encryption. This section here is going to contain all the user credentials that I have harvested along the way. In, in my case, um, actually, I'll show you that right here. I'll ask the agent for a heartbeat from the control center, right? So the control center um, will ask the agent. Uh, can you report back in who you are? Just send me a heartbeat. Uh, so this is the name of the server. Um, this is the user that is uh, that that the agent is running as, right? Because uh, any process runs in a particular user space, and that particular uh, agent of ours runs that as administrator, which is pretty cool, right? So it means I have fairly elevated rights on that server. Um, so in this auth end section, I would include other credentials that I have harvested along the way, right? Maybe the maybe the password for your Wi-Fi, uh, so that I can attack that, or maybe uh, some uh, some Active Directory credentials that I will need for to get the uh, to get on a on a file share, or maybe maybe these are your AWS S3 credentials or your access key and secrets, um, because that's where your your backups are being uh, being held, right? So. Everything that I have been able to harvest along the way will be in that section here when it comes to credentials. And then in the host session will be every single server that I will attack during this attack. And again, it's an array, so it can be multiple. And in my case, it's just this one server. Um, I will basically impersonate just as the local, whatever the agent is running as, that's what I will be using. And then I have an array of very specific targets that I will target, right? Uh, and because this is a FileMaker server, and again, uh, this is not stuff that I need to sort of like guess at, right? As everything that happened uh, leading up to the attack was taking stock and inventory of what you have. So I already know that your FileMaker server is configured with an additional database folder on the D drive called My Files. Uh, I know what the default backups folder is. I know what the default database folder is. Uh, so you have a, a custom backups folder and a custom uh, Live Files folder. And I'll attack those. That's that's part of my instructions. And I'll use this encryption key here uh, to do that stuff. All right. So that is the policy, right? That is my plan of attack that I will execute against your server. Um, that's what I put together based on everything that I've learned uh, from you. Right. Right. So uh, back to my control center. Uh, it's time to pull the trigger. This is where I will actually execute that plan of attack, right? So I'll do policy exec, um, and I'll pick my file, and there it is. It's the full encryption policy, right? So before I send that over, uh, you'll see that happening here, but I'll open up, um, uh, this is not a bad one, right? So this is one of my 
Um, this is the, 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 the non-standard backups location, so the custom backup location. This is one of my backups. Um, and this is one of the, these other backup files that I have in there. Uh, and as you can see, they are now just regular FileMaker files. So if I go back to here and I say, yep, go ahead and send that. So you can see that the agent has received the instructions and the agent is now going through these instructions and, um, and you can see it happening in the background there, right? So it's, it's finding the files, it's encrypting the files. So that is the attack in action. And when it's done, it'll basically, um, in the control center, I can basically, whatever I'm seeing here that the agent does, I can see the same thing in my control center uh, if, I, uh, if I want to. Um, I'll let this run. I'll actually go have a quick peek at my route. Oops. So you can see it's working its way through my live files at this point. And, and again, this is the kind of activity that because we can simulate it, you can now test whether you can actually pick up on the fact that this is happening, right? So that's a crucial part of the defenses. Uh, and I keep coming back to the same thing is know your normal, right? So this is not normal, clearly. Uh, the FileMaker files should not be renaming. The disk activity should be happening. So hopefully you can uh, you can detect that. Um, I have two files that are uh, actively being hosted on that FileMaker server, right? So there's this OAuth tester and the connection test. So I wanted to show you that real quick uh, because, um, and Chris sort of hinted at that, when the attack is done, the attack is still uh, running here, when, oh sorry, it is actually done right now. It's going back to sleep mode. So in my live files, you can see that all of my FileMaker hosted files have been encrypted at this point, except for this one file that was opened by a FileMaker server, right? The other files in my live uh, uh, folder, they weren't actively opened by FileMaker. I, I have them on my FileMaker server, but they were not actively being host, hosted. This file was, and you can see that the um, encryption attack actually left it, left it alone. Um, Chris hinted at that because FileMaker Server has a lock on a file, every single file that FileMaker Server has hosted is locked by FileMaker Server, right? So um, anything that goes to the file system, the operating system file system to try and manipulate that file will run in, into that wall uh, and FileMaker Server will say, oh, the operating system will detect that there's a lock and say, no, you can't touch the file because- All right, let's stop it there. So I mean, that I think it's, you, you know, a lot of us have had a database crash and had to recover from it. And I think uh, for a bunch of people, ransomware is a little bit abstract. They don't see what it looks like and how it behaves and stuff like that. And so I think it's really valuable to, you know, stand up a VM, attack it with a ransomware simulator and sort of see what it looks like and try and brainstorm how you might respond to it. I think practicing these sorts of security events are very useful to figure out how you're going to recover from them. You know, if you have to spin up a cloud server because your FileMaker server is completely down and grab a backup, where are you gonna grab the backup from? What if it's been encrypted? Um, if you do need to spin up a cloud server, is the person who has the credentials to get onto AWS in? What if they're out sick or on vacation? There's all sorts of contingencies you should probably think through and plan through while you're calm as opposed to when FileMaker server is down, nobody can do their jobs and people start yelling. And so uh, I think uh, actually rehearsing these scenarios is super valuable. And, you know, with uh, Racketeer, and we'll give you the URL to get to Racketeer, um, you can start to try and do some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't know, yeah. Or you can just watch the video again. <laughs> There we go. So Wim kept, kept mentioning know your normal, and I should mention that in a previously slide, um, or as we started out, is part of catching any kind of attack or phishing or any when we were talking about devices is knowing what your normal is like. And um, this is discussed in the cybersecurity framework that Andre also talked, Andre also talked about this yesterday. So this is the National Institute of Science and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. And it's just a framework to help you um, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover from any kind of attack. And so um, it's also useful for when you um, create a 
disaster recovery plan because you're identifying your assets, you're seeing what do you need to protect, and then detect is that know your, you have to know your normal in order to know whether there's an anomaly or event. Um, if we have anything slow down on our network, Chris, uh, Chris is like, are we being attacked? You know, because that is one, as you saw in the simulation, um, encryption takes a lot of resources and you can see things happening. So um, that does give you a clue that something might be happening. Um, so knowing your normal and be able to detect anomalies or security privilege escalations or anything, um, responding having a response plan is something nobody wants to do. No customers want to do it, nobody wants to do it, but it's not just relevant for cybersecurity attacks, it's, it's relevant for national disasters, it's relevant for hardware failures, it's relevant for a lot of things. So it's a useful thing to do and then to know how to recover. If you're gonna spin up an instance and put your servers up somewhere temporarily, um, what credentials you need to change, um, et cetera. And the great thing about this framework is it is the blueprint for you to create a security plan to what are we going to do and how are we going to do it if something happens. And so that gives you the sort of paint by numbers uh, plan of action to do this. And if you have uh, customers or leadership who aren't interested in spending the time and money it takes to actually put something like this together, you should talk to their or your cybersecurity insurer because they've been losing tons of money lately and they've put a lot more rules in place like you have to have multi-factor authentication and so on and so forth. And they may say, we will not cover your organization unless you do these things and have a plan like this. And so uh, appealing to the cyber, uh, cyber insurance carrier can actually force this to, uh, you know, resources to be allocated to get this moved. Okay, so um, several of the things that you need to do to protect your FileMaker server attack service, and we talked about attack service normally today, it's a combination, or earlier today, it's a combination of your attack vectors, you want to lower, lower that. So it's critical to protect your database and backup directories and to have immutable off-site backups. And, and so, you know, a command, the agent who gets in there, if you have a Dropbox connected to the server, and uh, they get in there, they can get to anything on that Dropbox. Um, so if you're, you, you should have immutable offsite backup. Is everyone familiar with that term, immutable? Uh -huh. It's unchangeable. You basically lock uh -huh. the file. This cannot be edited or deleted or anything. It's usually for some period of time, three months, six months, a year. Um, AWS Glacier has this feature. You can S3 say, does, S3 does, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can put a file up there and say, uh -huh. lock this for whatever uh -huh. period of time. Yeah. And then if you need, you know, even if the ransomware attackers get to that, they can't encrypt it, and then you would be able to use that as something to recover from. Yep. And the three top attack vectors. I think we talked about this a little bit earlier: uh, email phishing, unpatched software, and weak passwords. So those are, you know, three areas not to be neglected there. Um, and, you know, what we say is don't click links in emails these days. Go to the site and log in. It's not convenient, but it's the way to get around it. Um, and then additional things you can do is have like a application control program, program that monitors for new executables, um, disable the VS admin tool in Windows to prevent ransomware from deleting volume copies and disable script hosts and Windows PowerShell. Now, some of the pro ransomware gangs, they can just re-enable PowerShell if they need it to do their dirty work. But, um, you know, again, you might uh, defeat some of these, you know, less expensive, lower code uh, ransomware gangs. Do you have anything else to add there? We're good, okay. All right, again, so this is um, kind of partly the detect, not protect, but knowing your normal and, you know, protecting by whitelisting your set of hosted databases and monitoring the database directory, checking for unexpected files, and we did a little experimenting with this. Um, and then monitoring for anom anomalies, you know, like if you use a Zabbix or something, checking every morning about disk disk space usage increases and processor activity, um, looking. How many people here use Zabbix or some other Anyone? monitoring yeah. tool, not yours, what have you? You can yeah. configure Z yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Zabbix or whatever your monitoring tool is to watch the FileMaker databases folder and say, I am expecting to see these 10 files in here. If there's anything else, 
you know, and if they encrypt it, the name will change, right? Mm -hmm. And so if anything else happens, let me know. And so um, uh, things like that can give you an early warning yep. uh, or at least catch the attacker in the act. Yep, and we talked earlier about, um, you know, checking your backups, right? Both personally and business-wise once a week or once a month, you know, but if you check your backups, that'll give you a sign that attack is underway if they're being encrypted. Uh, and then if you're alerting, like Zebex allows you to alert people, you know, make sure you're using three contacts and make sure that when contacts don't get alerted, they don't just assume someone else is gonna deal with it. Uh, just making sure someone sees the alert. Yeah, and I'm, I, I personally am really interested in these new automation tools like Devon. Uh, it's designed for DevOps, but wouldn't it be great if I could have an automated process that says, go spin me up a new FileMaker server in the cloud, go grab my mutable backup, attach yeah. to that, open the databases, you know, run some sample script that says, yes, okay, we're functioning and we're not corrupt or anything like that, and then close it all down. And so I could have a daily test that says, is my backup infrastructure working and am I able to do this with a push button? That would be fantastic if I know for certain that within five minutes I can have another FileMaker server backup. That would give some, someone, anyone, a lot of peace of mind. Yep. Uh, another thing I didn't mention here is you might see the antivirus or the anti-malware scanner is disabled. That's something that, you know, a ransomware gang can do as well. There's a lot they can do. Um, so a couple things we looked into is, you know, ransomware is likely to have system privileges. So we could test to see if we could prevent system from reading or writing to the database or backups directory and block dance ransomware or we could detect security changes on certain direct on those directories um, and that's how we would you know know this wasn't normal if something like that was happening and uh, we could I wrote a little PowerShell script to detect if the new file was created and then I found out that um, a lot of people recommend you turn off PowerShell on servers if you don't need it because you know that can often be compromised by ransomware gangs but the you know the really pro ransomware games can turn it back on anyway, so it's that's a that's a toss up. Uh, and then the other thing we looked at was um, so you know when we're showing you how you're seeing all that information, you know, and a ransomware game's not going to see all they're not going to display all that information like oh we can see there's a ransomware guy and they're doing all this and uh, they're not going to display that. What they they even when the agent comes in there, a lot of uh, ransomware uh, services basically hide the file, right? Hide the agent um, using something called a rootkit so that you don't know it's in there. You know, you the only way you know it's in there is you, you know, you have this extra uh, disk space usage or, um, you know, some of those other things we mentioned that starts doing things. And so uh, Chris had this idea that, oh, we should use the tools of the, what'd you call it? Using yeah, the, the enemy against it, themselves. Yeah, the tools of the enemy against themselves, right? So I found this uh, root kit called R77. This is not approved by Claris. Um, and basically, is this plan? All right. So what this does before we start, oh, that's a good place to stop actually, um, is by default it hides any directory or file that starts with $77, I believe, which is, a, I don't have any files named that. But what you can do is you can configure it using the Windows registry. And remember, Chris, Chris mentioned that Windows is the biggest uh, vul target, vulnerable FileMaker server target so far. And you can configure it to basically hide uh, your FileMaker server directory or FileMaker backup directories. So you're hiding it from when the ransomware agent comes in there it's you know enumerating through directories looking for data looking for servers and so if we could hide it from the explorer or dir then that agent is not going to see it so i've configured it to hide filemaker server and i'm going to inject this rootkit into my explorer process so, so if i what this is on the virtual machine Yes. Sorry. Oh no. I just messed it up. Okay. All right. So I'm in Explorer. 
can see, see the FileMaker server. And then I'm going to inject it in Explorer again. And when I refresh, you can't see FileMaker server anymore. And then right. I can do the same thing in with DIR. So I'm going to inject it into command. And now when I do a dir, can't see FileMaker server anymore. But the thing is, is that it's still there. It just can't be enumerated by those processes. And so the FileMaker server is still going to open a file because FMS admin still knows where it is. And same thing with the client. Did you want to say something? No, you're good. I mean, it's basically an invisibility cloak for uh -huh. your FileMaker server and the databases and the backup. You can choose to hide whatever directories you want or the entire thing and just make the FileMaker server directory itself invisible to processes that are trying to list digital assets on the drive, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah quick, quick, I'm curious. Uh, how, how sensitive That's an open question. It's an open question right now, but you know, I mean, this isn't going to go away, right? This ransomware threat isn't going to go away. So we consider it, you know, evolving research. It, it might be, you know, it might be that five years from now, everybody has to hide their assets, you know, because there's just ransomware is, I don't know. I hope not, but. <laughs> you know, in, uh. in this basic test though, it works fine. If yeah. server functions properly, you can yep. log into it from the client. Uh -huh. um, I imagine if you wanted to use the command line interface, that might cause you a problem there. But it's the kind of thing where you could disable it, do whatever maintenance tasks you might need to do, and turn it back on. And you know, in the middle of the night when you're not there and it's running, you don't care. It's not causing you any trouble, but it might cause trouble for ransomware agents. Right. And there might be some ransomware agents that could get around this, but there might be a good, you know, 80% of them that can't. And so, um, yeah. So again, it, not approved in any official way, but it seems to work fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think we're getting close on time, aren't we? We're all right. Yeah. So what are the good practices? Um, as we mentioned, ransomware gangs seem to be really good at attacking Windows ecosystems. And uh, domain servers especially seem to be uh, very vulnerable. And I think we have a slide in here later that says, if you're running hypervisor to manage your VMs, do not join it to your domain server because domain servers seem to be dropping like flies these days. So don't join your um, domain or your hypervisor to the domain. And if you have like a network repository of um, backups where you're actually, you know, taking say the database backup off FileMaker server and moving it to some remote storage, you should be pulling that, not pushing it. So you don't want FileMaker server to have that mounted as an external volume and then push that out there you want to have it log into the FileMaker server and pull it so that FileMaker doesn't have a jump point that an agent might exploit to get to your network uh, backup repository. Um, we already mentioned that hosting on Mac OS or Linux uh, helps. It's not, uh, you know, uh, an absolute protection, but it seems to help. On Mac OS, there's a shareware utility from Objective-C called ransomware, and that'll stop the show on any process that's trying to encrypt any file. And I tend to run into it when I'm using Google Apps. It's like, hey, Google seems to be trying to encrypt something here. But it works great. And, uh, you know, again, a highly sophisticated attacker would probably be able to get around that. But, you know, it's just something to uh, have in your toolkit. Uh, phishing awareness training, no before is sort of the, the standard bearer in this area. So if uh, someone has been attacked, typically the cyber insurer will dictate that they get phishing awareness training. So it's coming sooner or later for uh, most companies. And then good logging practices. Um, Heidi and I saw a DEF CON talk from a guy who does incident response, and he had a great quote, which was, what am I going to do with all these logs? Said no incident responder ever. And so the more information you can have, the better off you'll be. And I think the default log size is like 10 or 20 meg. On Windows. On Windows. And he said, you know, make those things as big as you can possibly get them. If you can have a 100 or 150 megabyte log, do so because you're going to have a larger time window of events that's happening. And if you have to respond to an event, uh, you'll uh, have a lot more information to determine what you're dealing with. Oh, and you should also aggregate logs. 
And so there are different things like uh, Zabbix can do this, Splunk can do this, New Relic. Uh, Scenes is a security incident event manager. There's also a SOAR, security orchestration, um, and something, something, I can't remember the rest of it. And so um, you can build these yourselves. There's off the shelf products, there's open source products. Uh, you should look into these because uh, it would be great if you do get hit by something for you to have a nice big fat log of uh, uh, a bank of log files to review. So there has been some good research recently. Um, this guy was a PhD student at MSU, Michigan State University in Michigan. And uh, he did a ton of research on ransomware and he was looking at where the encryption keys tended to be stored in memory. In his angle of attack, defense, whatever you want to call it, was uh, doing memory forensics. So he'd run these things in a VM, freeze the VM, dump all the processes, figure out what was the, the bad process running, and then he could actually extract encryption keys from it. So he worked this all out and did a research paper that's like 200 pages long. It's a heck of a read, but um, interesting stuff. And uh, he developed a tool called Pickpocket that will actually race the ransomware. Like if it sees ransomware going, it's like, all right, I'm gonna come after you. And while the thing's trying to encrypt, it's trying to attack the process and extract the decryption key at the same time. And so it's pretty cool. It may, on, on smaller files, it may lose the race, but on larger files, it'll probably win the race and actually capture the um, decryption key. And then as soon as it gets it, it punts it off to an offsite server. So even if the whole server locks up, it's actually captured it. And then you don't have to pay for the decryption key. You've got it. And so that's really cool. He so I was thinking about this, though. They could still have your data, right? And exploit you for your data. Yes, they yeah. can still get your data. Yeah. But um, this guy inspired some other people. And um, there's this really cool, let me just jump over here for a second. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. could. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't I, I haven't heard yeah. much in the way of so anecdotes yeah, about that. Yeah. 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 yeah, you gotta make it easy for them to get there, yeah. I wanted to show this article though, and I have the link to it in the uh, slide deck. But this author actually took that concept in that research paper and ran with it. And so his thing is if you, and I'll just run through the list here. If you are running in a VM, so I would have to say these days a best practice is to run your FileMaker server in a virtual machine. Take a snapshot, then suspend. You can use uh, VMSS as core to create a memory dump file. There's another utility called Volatility to create a raw version of the file. This will list all the processes running in that image. So you've basically frozen the thing in time, and then you can sort of extract what the heck was going on in that uh, snapshot. So you can list all the processes, Google each one, figure out if any of them might be associated with uh, ransomware. There's a tool called DLL List that will uh, capture all the DLLs running in that process. Then you can dump and actually run in isolation the selected process, and then use idle spy to uh, decompile the executable. And in there, you can actually find a list of the encryption keys. So this looks like a heavy lift. It is a heavy lift. I'd rather use pickpocket myself. But um, you know, if you're in a jam and you need to get your stuff unlocked, this will help you do it. But this is the uh, link to that URL. Fascinating read. Um, also, um, if you have been attacked by a lazy ransomware gang, these are colloquially known as skip kitties. They might have found some old ransomware on a website somewhere and just tried to run it. Uh, there are decryptors available for some flavors of ransomware. And so if you just Google ransomware decryptors, you can find tons of websites that have them. They're worth a try if you have no other option. So your question made me think, you know, I wonder if these ransomware games use a password manager or a decryptor <laughs> key manager, you know, because they're, you know, they're working with multiple, I don't know, customers, right? So they need to have all these decryption keys. So then you'd have more to manage if you had several. Yep. 
you know, it's our thought that if you have a school management day Sunday morning, we should be hit by denial of service at the SMR. <laughs> but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we know where they are, and we should be denied. Yeah. All right, so summary of best practices um, to protect against ransomware. Always use EIR to protect against exfiltration of data. Always pull backups from FileMaker server. Don't push to off server backups. Uh, enable immutable cloud backups. We talked about that earlier. Archive logs into a C, you know, SIEM is, uh, that's Windows only, isn't it? Nope. Is it? Okay. Um, and monitor for changes to FileMaker server. And I don't know, this is a pretty complex one to, I mean, it's just extra research to set up, but um, you know, you might want to consider a honeypot machine and how many people are familiar with the, what that is. And it doesn't have to be anything uh -huh. sophisticated. You could That's just spin true. up a VM. You could have a uh, Raspberry Pi sitting on your network plugged in. It just would alert if anyone tried to access it. So, um, you know, for 40, 50 bucks, you can have a perfectly fine honeypot that will help. Yeah. And so it's going to see what's, you know, who's attacking, trying to attack. Um, file, run FileMaker server in a VM. Um, and re, um, I guess we didn't get to this, but the, um, you know, disaster recovery series. You should really be uh, rehearsing detection and disaster recovery scenarios. So you're cool, calm, and collected, uh, you know, if something happens, when something happens. And it's not just for cybersecurity, it's for all. Uh, sorts of disasters and you can bring server and customers back up and uh, we had a few slides on that but we had to shorten it for the hour so um, but it is a really important point to have a disaster recovery uh, plan for if something happens because there's all sorts of things that need to happen from you know uh, stopping stopping it from spreading shutting down maybe needing to deciding whether you're going to uh, pay ransom contacting the people who need to be contacted. There's just a no, numerous amounts of things and you can Google disaster recovery plan um, for, you know, kind of a template of what to use there. Think, think about all, you know, in the event of something like this happening, think about all the people that you might have to contact. You might need the company attorney. You would probably have to call the cyber insurer. You may have to call some government entity if you have mandatory reporting requirements. You have to have the leadership of your company or whoever could make the yes, no call on whether or not to pay the ransom. Um, you might have to have a designated person to communicate with your customers to explain why you're, you're having a system outage or why their orders are uh, not going out or why they might get contacted by a ransomware gang. So there's all sorts of things that need to be communicated out from the events response team. Plus you need people working on this. So mm -hmm. it, uh, you should uh, really have yeah, assignments yeah. ahead of time about who's going to respo be responsible mm -hmm. for what and who's going to be responsible for communicating with who. And those people you know, if you contact your cyber and uh, security insurer, they may insist on running the show and say, we're going to be in charge here or else we're not covering <laughs> you. So um, there, there may be some decisions imposed upon you and it'd be great to know that ahead of time. The other thing is, is remember we talked about they like to attack during the night. They also like to attack on holiday weekends, right? Where people might not be as alert or around. And so it's just something you're smiling <laughs> to be aware of. Um, so. Just watch out for the holidays. Yeah. Uh, it is an interesting anecdote. When the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, ransomware ac activity really dropped off a, a, a cliff. Some of the largest ransomware gangs have both Russian and Ukrainian members, and there was a little mini civil war going on there for a while. And then towards the end of summer, activity picked back up, and it was mostly Russian attackers. Yep. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that keeps me awake at night, we, we've been hosting for 12 years now. Uh -huh. uh, we use it as a delivery mechanism like for our CRMs, uh -huh. our customer systems. Yeah. Uh, we screen FileMaker, so there's no FileMaker running on any of our clients. Uh -huh. it, it's entirely within its AD land uh -huh. and we can maintain the internet infrastructure. Um, we partner those servers down as much as we can over the years. They're absolutely by minimum processes required to either pull node out or um, file make a code or get the code to the um, We cover as much as we can. Um, the one thing that keeps me awake is we, we run SOPOS on all our servers. We make sure it doesn't touch the live databases and it doesn't actively scan the um, external source data in, in downstreams. 
We run overnight a, a, a scripted scan of all the external uh, internal tools. Um, and so it's the only stored files that can be encountered. And that's the one that's quite interesting. It went officially quite negative as far as tracking end users and using the virus when it's stored. If someone were to upload a file with a payload, and then somebody downloads that and opens it and executes that load. I just feel that FileMaker is offering a chance of spreading viruses, ransomware, because of the, the lack of interaction of packet scanning within the external storage containers. And that's why you run the script, that's yeah. That's keeps me awake at night. Yeah. Uh -huh. anything. I mean, we, we do use the uh, we really keep one backup on the server. Uh -huh. A lot. We have uh -huh. It gets one backup and does a file. Amazon, uh, we have script running uh, Amazon CLI. Gets pulled over to S3. Mm -hmm. Gets stored for the clients to download it. Uh -huh. them. And manually, every Saturday morning, I sit there and I copy off all those encrypted encrypted uh -huh. address files. And those get locked away on an external hard disk away from the internet. But it's that external yeah. small container hole that, that that's what keeps me awake at night. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, because it's so would be so easy for yeah. I mean we used to have so sort of worry about viruses within uh -huh. Microsoft yeah. uh, Word files and Excel files and DBA and things like that. But now we've got sort of payloads of entirely different scales. Um, I've never had an adequate comparison with a virus that you know, it's, it's disappointing. Well, there's yeah. virus at the back of the room here, Julie. Just messing with you, Julie. Yeah, I remember seeing a talk at DEF CON about um, uh, malware downloaded via Kindle, like ebooks. Can Yeah. 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 And the one, just I used to do first line frontline support, and I have been through a ransomware attack. Oh, okay. Oh, and that, I know obscure, uh, security by obscurity is no security at all. The one thing that rescued that client is, is yeah. it was an independent financial advisor directly forwarded an email from um, an insurance company which happened every day to his PA, said, follow this up, and it injected the ransomware into the system. Mm -hmm. But coming from a Mac background, uh -huh. I used retrospect for the backup. And the ransomware didn't know what a retrospect file was. So the only reason they got out of that, because it was, you know, it was a push backup, yeah. was the fact that it didn't encrypt the retrospect back up because it didn't recognize it. didn't know what it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was one thing on the, um, you know, detecting files thing. I tried PowerShell, and then Chris was like, well, what about using, you know, y use something obscure because then nobody will know, you know, like VS Batch or something, Win or yeah, there, Win maybe. Batch, yeah, maybe. yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, maybe they won't know it. Uh, on uh, cloud-based stuff, um, you know, some cloud hosting companies have been getting attacked. So I, I think it's really important to have segmentation where you don't have one key to the kingdom that gets you everything. Like, you know, divide your servers right. into four groups or something like that, and one login will get you a quarter of them. And that way, you, yeah, you can like people always up. talk about. You know, you never share the root credentials. You have your different admins, but the thing is, people reuse credentials all the time in their personal and their we. And yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've always, I've, I've loved trying to use a different um, port for things like Go because mm -hmm. because we're not actually installing FileMaker on anybody's mm -hmm. machine. We could actually tie the IP address down to our remote access, uh -huh. but because we've got remote access, okay, we, we've got some web browser uh -huh. that's been an issue, but if we could have Go coming in on a different port to Pro, mm -hmm. we could actually lock Pro down entirely and get right. away like it was, it was a, you know, it's a, it's a functionality, but, but again, everybody's sharing sort of IP or root, so it's well, yeah. a sort of secondary way to do that. I mean, you can have a, you can have firewall settings that allow the other ports to come in on whatever traffic, but then if you don't have any Go, uh, never ever allow like a full access on a Go account. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Or or web direct. Yeah. That get you most of the variation. So that would get you most of the variation. It, it would help for sure. And uh, we're constantly bogging these things down. You can't do you can't connect with an admin uh, without the encryption. You know, we only allow encrypted connections if they're internal files, and you can't do it with a desktop file or anything like that. Um, but uh, it, it, it's still yeah. So the, External uh, files and containers. That's that's the one that I, I really just feel it's a, you know, you could spread through an organization just with one corrupt file and, and 
you know, if, if we've all used, um, you know, uh, download the file to a temporary location and automatically open the file to read the PDF, and if that has an executable in there, you know, that's running on my remote app server, that's not actually, we're, we're not actually even opening Adobe uh, Acrobat or anything on uh, the local machine. Um, but even then, that is then fed randomly to my server. Mm -hmm. I just have to step back and ask one other question. I didn't think the FileMaker server policy said don't run virus scans on external containers like this. Those are not open and locked files by the database policy, mm -hmm. right? I, Am I wrong? I, I would rather to answer that because I've certainly read and I don't keep up to date day to day on what the situation is, but my understanding is that uh, there shouldn't be any third party interaction with the live open open files and any related container files. Okay. Which is why we do it. We, we can cautionally scan overnight. There's no reason to do it. Nothing's being touched. Yeah. So we run through them just in case. But uh, I, I, would, I would prefer to be actively scanning the container files. Um, yeah, I would ignore FileMaker's advice on that. I, I would think I would agree with you on that. that. <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of things that, that FileMaker recommends on their server things that are just don't have any use. Yeah, but we don't admit to them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like if we get we get shut down in fines if we go online and settings like that. You can't do that. I don't know, minimum RAM requirements and a whole bunch of other things just don't just yeah. just sort of cover your ass settings or not anything. Yeah, I, I agree. Now the actual database files for sure because that's definitely open and locked and yeah. not scanning them. Yeah. So we can't go that way from any particular point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. This was great. Thank great. you. Great. 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 Great.